Matthew here, your BRS beginner guru, and today in episode eight is the climax of three months of work. We're at fish. For the first time ever, we've gone 100% captive bred. Every year, breeders are adding more species to their portfolios. And the more we buy captive bred, the faster we transition away from live caught sources. Before we reveal our stock list, let's get our new additions out of the box. To reduce stress, I'm going to turn down all the lights in the room and turn off the aquarium lights. I'll check each bag to make sure all the new fish and inverts are alive and well, and then float them in the aquarium. We call this process temperature acclimation, and it equalizes the 77 degree temperature in the tank water with the temperature in each of the bags. I'm going to float the new arrivals for an hour or so while I finish a couple tasks I've been putting off. First up, we need to do a few water tests to establish our baseline. I cycled the tank several weeks ago and have been feeding the copepods phytoplankton daily. I've cycled so many tanks by this point that I'm almost certain it's safe, but it would be remiss of me not to check for ammonia. Like I thought, the ammonia level was near zero, so moving on to nitrate and phosphate next. These are going to be important to track, especially with the addition of livestock today. As the introduction of fish food and waste will likely cause these two parameters to soar. And if I'm not careful, nuisance algae will quickly take off. Since I've had the lights on and been feeding phytoplankton these last couple of weeks, there is a small diatom outbreak, which will be perfect food for the new inverts. As I expected, my nitrate and phosphate levels are low, even though I know they're going to start to rise soon. But I have a couple tricks up my sleeve to halt the inevitable. First, it's time to set up our hang on the back refugium. I've been growing Kato and other algae in my water box frag system for months now, so I'm going to break off a large portion for Aquamax HOB refugium. Starting a refugium too early before the livestock arrival would have been a futile exercise as there just wouldn't have been enough nitrates and phosphates to feed the macroalgae. I have learned two important lessons over the years with various successful and failed macroalgae refugium attempts. First, the stronger the light, the greater the growth. Crank those PAR levels to max and buy a light specifically tailored to grow plants. And second, you gots to use Brightwell's Kato Grow. Once your macroalgae growth takes off, it will suck iron and other nutrients from the water. Nutrients that macroalgae needs to grow and thrive. I'm going to blast my Kato with two lights using the waterproof Tunza Eco Chic from the top and the innovative marine Kato Max from the side. No fancy lighting schedule here, just full blast 24 hours a day. With my HOB Refugium up and running now, it's time for the second trick I have up my sleeve to combat those inevitable nutrient spikes, automatic water changes. It's of course true that a manual weekly 10% water change will do the trick just fine, but I found in the past eight years of doing this hobby, that I am not as consistent as I'd like to be. So for the past three months, I've been experimenting on my frag tank with 10% automatic water changes, and I am convinced my tank is happier and I am happier. We've already set up our Neptune Apex, so we just need to get our Neptune Dose up and running. Since this IM build is 40 gallons in total water volume, I will set up my automatic water change to remove four gallons each week. What's great about this auto water change setup is it will remove a small amount of water all throughout the day at hours of my choosing. And then once a week, I just refill the left bucket with fresh seawater and empty out the right bucket. This auto water change system combined with the hang on the back refugium is absolutely not necessary for success, but will go a long way to keeping my tank algae free. With these two tasks done, it's finally time to add the livestock. I asked my colleague Josh to help me out with the stock list. When choosing fish for your build, there's a lot of things to consider, such as size, aggression, habitat, diet, and coral. There's both a science and an art to building a thriving and happy ecosystem. For the time being, I've decided not to add any coral. I know from personal experience that the first three months after adding livestock can be a bit of a roller coaster. Nutrient spikes and algae blooms can make stability a bit challenging. So by holding off for a few months before adding coral, 
I'll keep things simple. So then what are we gonna add today? Let's start with the inverts. Three variegated sea urchins, a type of pincushion urchin. These voracious algae eaters will scour our glass and rock work day and night. Next, we have peppermint shrimp. Three in total, these peaceful cleanup crew members are great detritivores and scavengers and will eat leftover food on the sand bed and in the rock work. Now we've got our snails and crabs. We're adding a ton here to keep the glass clean, the rock work tidy, and the sand bed pristine. First are a few conks, great for turning over the sand bed and eating algae lower down in the tank. Then we have scarlet reef hermit crabs. These little guys are great at eating leftover food from small crevices in the aquascape and the sand bed. Moving on to our primary sand bed cleaners, the mighty Sarah snail. And lastly, everybody's favorite film algae eater, the self-riding banded trochus snail. And one more bonus invert is actually a pistol shrimp that's been hiding out in a small container in my frag tank for the last few months. I just know she's gonna be thrilled at having a much larger habitat. Moving on to the fish, you can't really build a saltwater aquarium without two clownfish, and we have chosen two caramel ocellaris clowns. They'll likely find a piece of the rock work to call home. This watchman goby will hopefully pair with our pistol shrimp and make a nice burrow together. Our pygmy file fish can actually change colors, will stay small, and likely won't go after any future coral additions. I'm gonna have to keep my eyes on these two neon dotty backs. They are super colorful additions, but can be jerks to smaller tank mates. And the last fish pair we're adding today are these Kamohara blennies. All right, we've got our new fish and inverts acclimated to their new home. I'm gonna leave the lights off until tomorrow to give them a chance to settle in stress-free. Since we've got quite a few different critters in here, we're going to need a few different foods. The trick will be pairing the right food with the right fish the right number of times each day, all in a way that won't overload our 40 gallon system. All of that coming up next in our pen ultimate episode, Nutrition. Click here to watch it now. And as always, thanks for watching. Happy reefing, be well, and we'll see you soon.